house. All right, let's get started. Okay, so um, last uh, lecture before stage one of the exam. Um, just a couple of little things and then I'm happy to take questions or we can roll on through things that might generate questions. So um, just a reminder about procedure here. So uh, only assignments we have to worry about are there's a muddiest point on Sunday. You can reflect back on uh, midterm stage one, if you like, you can reflect back on the whole course um, and so on. Uh, your final projects, those are due uh, Wednesday. So tomorrow night. And so um, the peer review assignments are made after all of them are in at 11.59 p.m. so that everyone's got Thursday, Friday, um, and Saturday to watch one video from another group and read one report from another group and then fill out those peer reviews. So that's the reason why the final projects are due kind of in the middle of the week. So people have time to do the peer reviews before the end of regulation, um, you know, this last week here. Other things to possibly consider is the student evaluations are uh, available, but they think they disappear Friday night. So if you want to evaluate the course and you haven't, then do so before Friday night. The final exam, uh, the individual stage one is this Thursday. The collaborative version is during finals week. Now I mentioned that I made the availability window for this Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. And I made the availability for stage two, uh, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. And so what that means is that the stage one exam, um, you'll be able to, uh, you'll be able to take that start at any time, Thursday, Friday, or Saturday, but it is time and it is a Respondus uh, lockdown browser based exam. Um, so once you start it, you have to finish it within the 90 minutes. So I provide 90 minutes because it's like 75 minutes of a normal class period plus little 15 minutes for technical snafus. If you want to come here Thursday, you can. You can take it in the class, kind of proctoring. And I don't think anybody will be here at the end of class. And so I'm happy to go the full 90 minutes here in class. But you're welcome to do it anytime you want, Thursday, Friday, or Saturday. And then stage two is exactly like the midterm. Uh, so that is going to open up Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. It's just going to be open. Uh, it's not time. And you can uh, open book, open notes. Uh, you can work with anyone currently enrolled in the course. Uh, so it is comprehensive, but keep in mind that a lot of the stuff we've done after the midterm is just applications of stuff before the midterm. So we kind of got more into delays, um, but then after that, we went into like various case studies. You know, we like looked at the SIR model. We looked at these, you know, other sorts of models, trying to build complexity into your models. But in principle, most of the models that we talked about after the midterm, you could use, you could understand with knowledge from before the midterm. Also keep in mind that in order to shove stage one into a class period, you know, it's, it's, it's the same length as the midterm. So it's not like, you know, normally if I were designing a final exam for finals week, I would use the whole 110 minutes. But um, this is actually, you know, basically going to be sort of a mimic of the midterm's length. So your experiences with the midterm should generalize, your midterm is like a model um, that should generalize to understanding what to expect on the final exam. Okay, um, so I um, mean, just a couple of things, just uh, the reminders here. So um, again, two stage. So um, on the stage one, you get one two-sided handwritten formula sheet, comprehensive, like I was just saying, but same length as midterm, like I was saying. Um, and then the rest of what I've got kind of in this review is if we want to go through this, I've just kind of picked out what I think are kind of the greatest hit slides from units E, F, and G um, to start with, all the post midterm units, and then um, A, B, C, and D. Um, and then that includes some of those practice exercises we had pre midterm. So we can work through these. So I can start through these and you can say, oh, there's a question there, like, you know. Um, uh, you know, I want to, you know, can, can we, can you talk about chaos again or something like that? Um, or if you've got questions up front, I'm happy to take those questions. We can just, I can bring out a tablet, I can work problems or whatever. So it's kind of up to you. So that's basically it. So are there any general questions? Yeah. For uh, the cumulative one, the one, two, four, six, four, one, is uh -huh. the class will be open Tuesday? Oh, yeah. Um, I will. Uh, I'll be here during the exam period and I 
it's on the, the Canvas calendar, and I keep saying, uh, before class, I should look that up. Um, it's an afternoon block. I think it starts sometime in the three, uh, the three o'clock period, but it's on the Canvas calendar when the actual time is there. So, uh, but so yes, if you'd like to come here to work in class, I will be here during finals week in the final exam period. Any other questions? It don't have to be about format. There could be like technical questions too. And also the questions online, anybody in chat or otherwise. Okay. So if there's no specific technical questions, then all I've got prepared again is like, um, is basically a bunch of these slides where I start with a unit and the learning outcome. So if you go on to Canvas, if you go into the Unit H final exam module, at the top of it, there's a study guide, which links to all of the unit specific study guides. And those unit specific study guides basically have a list of learning outcomes. So at the end of Unit E, this is what I would expect you to know. And so um, for most, these are, except for the things that are like VinSim specific, like I might show you a VinSim diagram or an Insight Maker diagram on the final exam and expect you to be able to interpret it. But it's the final exam isn't like a lab practical. Your final project is kind of like the practical. So I'm not gonna ask you necessarily about like, where do you find the units in VinSim? So that might be listed as a learning outcome, but, um, but things that are like specific to how do you operate the program, I kind of assume are gonna be um, assessed through your final project. So the final exam is focused on more of the kind of theoretical stuff, making sure that if somebody were to show you a stock and flow diagram, you would know what you're looking at. All right, so with that, again, I can just run through these and if people have questions, you can feel free to raise a hand um, um, or I can take questions now. Anything, any lingering? All right, well, if we cut to um, just after the midterm, we started out with this unit E where we started to um, expand um, how we were making these more realistic uh, models. And a big thing that we added was the delays. And so we'll kind of go through that. Um, and then uh, these lookup tables. So delays and lookup tables are kind of, uh, you know, a big thing. Um, and then, you know, the ability to use sliders and stuff like that. Um, you should know that sliders exist for the final exam, but like how to turn on sliders and then and all that, I won't be testing you on that. So if we go back and we think about that, like the lookup tables were kind of a big thing. So, um, you know, they capture relationships when you don't really have a formula for them. So if you're like trying to struggling with the formula, but if you know how to graph out the relationship you want, you just draw the graph in a lookup table. And so, um, you know, we've been working with this fish example where there's this lookup table that represents the, the, rep the relationship between fish density and net regeneration rate. So hopefully um, by now this idea that this graph is captured by a list of points and those points are kind of connected together so that if the simulation needs to look for a density in between those points, it kind of uses the line to kind of connect those. So that's how we end up getting an interpretation of these lookup tables. So um, in code, they're listed as a list of points, but when they're executed, it's actually a graph like this. And so those are our lookup tables. So any questions about lookup tables? This is I mean, one of the newer things after the midterm, you've had a bunch of time to play, uh, practice with them, but it's fine if there's still questions. All right, so we can build lookup tables in VinSim and in Insight Maker. Um, we can even connect lookup tables to time. So in VinSim, there was this shadow variable that helps you bring in a time element. And with the time, um, you can then build patterns in lookup tables. So that was something that uh, we chatted about. And that shows up in um, Insight Maker as well. So that's a common theme for lookup tables you can actually use them to represent patterns over time, as well as relationships between variables. Um, lookup tables can be linear like this, like in VinSim by default. They can also be um, kind of this non-interpolated form where they're sort of stepwise. Um, so when, you, when you're given a lookup table, it's important to know kind of what interpolation scheme they're using. Uh, you have to be explicit about this in VinSim where you actually have to put all the points on all the corners. But in Insight Maker, they just, you can switch them between these things here. But if I were to give you a lookup table that looked like this, hopefully you'd be able to know how to process it versus one that looked like the one that had all the diagonal lines on it. 
So just look up table stuff. And like I said, you can generate patterns over time. So lookup tables, everybody feel good about lookup tables? Typically a difficult subject, lookup tables, they're, um, they're meant to make modeling easier because you don't have to come up with formulas, but learning them, sometimes it's hard to wrap your mind around what's actually going on with them. So a lot of times you get questions on that. Other things we talked about were delays. And I mentioned there are two major types of delays. There are uh, fixed delays and smoothing delays. And so I gave this example of a car intersection. So if we think about cars waiting at a light to turn green, and it turns green, then at the instant it turns green, the cars don't instantly start moving. So if we look at the number of cars in the intersection, that's this kind of curved line here. We can think ideally all the cars instantaneously at light speed show up in the intersection, but that's not what happens. They trickle in. And so the relationship between the signal timing and the cars entering the intersection, we can model as a smoothing delay. And so some intersections, some parts of town or whatever, um, people will be kind of more eager to, uh, to launch into the intersection than others. And the kind of time constant there might represent how sluggish that intersection is. But then once they get in to the, um, into the, you know, through the intersection and onto the street block, and if they're traveling at a constant speed, then the number of cars at one point is going to be copied at a point a few seconds later because they're gonna move kind of in formation. So if you know how many cars are at point A and you wanna know how many cars are at point B, then you set up as a fixed delay. So whatever the simulation saw at point A here, two seconds later, it puts at point B over here. And that's the so-called fixed delay. So modeling things like transport delays. And so if I were to plot these two signals in VinSim or Insight Maker, the car's entering signal would uh, have a pulse when they cross like the line into this block. And that would be like a pulse of cars entering here. And if it's empty after that, so it's like say, you know, one car just went through there. Then if I wanna see, well, exiting, cars leaving the intersection, then we're not gonna see any cars leaving the intersection until whatever, 10 seconds later. So it's an exact copy. So in a smoothing delay, the input is like the signal timing and the edge gets kind of chopped off. And so you actually get a change in what it looks like. In the fixed delay, the input um, looks exactly the same as the output, it's just shifted over. So we use these two types of delays to represent um, things that happen in these systems. And the higher order delays um, end up sort of giving you an in-between. So um, a uh, second order smoothing delay um, is, has a little bit of a, an S shape to it as it starts looking more like this, where the, um, the edge, the rise happens later. And so a, a 20th order smoothing delay may as well be a fixed delay. Okay, so any questions about these delays, fixed delays and smoothing delays? So on a final exam, you might imagine, I might ask you uh, what types of delays would you expect for certain things? So I might say like, give an example of a fixed delay, select an example of a fixed delay, um, or is this better modeled as a fixed delay or a smoothing delay? So here's some examples of fixed delays. So I've got like schooling behavior. So clusters of animals that don't spread out, they kind of move together like a big ball, like fish schooling. Um, or age structure and populations um, who, you know, there were 20 kindergartners and then a year later there are 20 first graders and a year later there's 20 second graders and so on. So these are um, examples of things we model with fixed delays. And, um, you know, smoothing delays then are things that do get spread out over time. So you get a shock to a system and then it takes a while for that um, to, um, uh, to, to pan out. So like, you know, if you, if you take drugs like pharmaceuticals, you, 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 there's like timed release drugs. So you take them all at once, but they hit your stomach, but then they might actually be releasing. So if you take like a decongestant, that's a 12 hour decongestant, you take it at one instant, but um, it then doesn't, all of the decongestant doesn't hit your body all at once. It gets spread out over 12 hours. And it's the same idea here is that, you know, you can, um, you can take, you can ingest food. And so 
your stomach gets that food at a particular moment and it stays in your stomach for a particular time, but the nutrients that enter your bloodstream don't immediately hit your bloodstream. It takes a while for them to ramp up. And then maybe as the food even exits your stomach, if there's still nutrients being processed by the lining of your stomach, then um, the nutrients won't fall off immediately. They themselves will fall off kind of in smoothing to here. So these are examples of smoothing delays where there's this extra spreading out of the inputs. Okay, so um, and I think I've got just sort of a couple of slides that are just saying all of this. So we also call this exponential damping. So uh, the toilet tank is another great example of that. The water doesn't immediately show up in the tank. There's uh, it's spread out over time. So you would like to instantaneously when the tank gets flushed it to get refilled immediately, but um, even though it was flushed at one time, it takes maybe another 30 seconds for the water to rise up to some terminal level. All right, questions about fixed versus smoothing delays or anything else that this might have inspired you to ask about? Okay, yeah. Uh, the uh, I would say that the the whole blue line as it rises goes up to the top and then falls. I would view that as the input to the smoothing delay, and so that's the reason why the red line looks like a shark fin. So this is the response to the initial rise, and then when this falls, this is the response to the fall. So if this were a fixed delay, we would expect the red curve to look like a box, but just be over here. But because it's a smoothing delay, you do get an instantaneous response, but it's just very sluggish. And then likewise, it responds when the blue line falls, but it's a very sluggish response. Okay. Great question. Any other questions about delays? Right, this particular type of output we would call a step response. So um, if you're trying to figure out, like I wanna model my toilet tank, um, but I don't know what time constant to put into my simulation model. Well, what you can do is you can uh, you know, flush the toilet. And then if you've got like a laser vibrometer or something that can actually measure the height of the water as it goes, if you're plotting the height of the water in the real system, then we have this thing called a time constant, or um, in this case, just the delay, where it is the point in time where the rise is 63.2% or 63.21%. And so if um, I know that the rise started at one second and two and a half seconds later, you reach 63% of the final value, then I would say the time constant or the delay for this is 2.5 seconds. So that's the interpretation of what this delay is. It's kind of related to a half-life, but instead of being half, instead of using 50%, they use this number 63.2%. Why do they use this funny number? It actually just makes the math easier because um, when we're modeling this in our equations, you basically can model this as however, whatever the population is that you're decaying divided by that time constant. So if I were to use a half-life, there would be like, uh, you know, logarithms that would be involved as well. So this just makes the math simpler. Um, it's an ugly number here, but it's an easy number for us to measure. And if we do that, then in your formulas, it's like the toilet tank model, it's just tank gap divided by that number. That's how you model that delay. Okay. So I could give you, I guess, a step response um, on uh, you know, a, a test and say, what is the time constant for this smoothing delay? And you would just have to, and I would make it easier, like I give you grid lines and things like that, and you could then go on and see. And I might you know, throw in this little trick where I actually make the step happen a little bit later. So you have to know that there's, you look for the gap between when it starts and when it gets there. So it's not 3.5 seconds, it's 2.5 seconds because the step started at one. Okay. Questions online? Want to leave anybody behind? Okay. All right. So we did this example. Um, 
Uh, so we have already done this kind of example back when we were doing this lecture. But uh, so if I looked, I gave, you, I gave you this one here. The step response starts at one. The question is, what uh, delay should we use if we were implementing this? And I could see that um, up here, if I go to around 63% and draw it over, it seems to hit around three. Well, because three minus one is two, then that tells me that the time constant here, sorry, I thought I had a slide, the time constant here would be two seconds. So I would do a two in this one here because it takes two seconds for this thing to rise up to about 63%. All right, so any questions about the delays, fixed and smoothing delays? All right, so this is just more stuff about uh, the smoothing delays and interpretations of the smoothing delays, uh, formulas we use for the smoothing delays and so on. So I'll just step through these things, but, um, and I only leave these slides in here uh, because I, I just want to emphasize once I get through the kind of th these examples of smoothing delays. So Eric mentioned in his lecture that when you saturate the, uh, the soil with water, when you do flood irrigation, that it, um, the heat capacity of the water is so much higher than um, the heat capacity of the dry soil and of the air that although it, um, there's an immediate cool down effect due to some of the evaporation. Um, it actually takes longer for the yard to cool down at night. And that's because all this heat gets loaded up into the yard. And then when the ambient temperature drops, the heat then gets dumped from the yard back into the ambient. So the ambient now can't cool down as quickly. And that heat capacity is um, a parameter representing one of these smoothing delays that we're talking about here. So um, if you want to buffer temperature, one of the things you can do with a to buffer temperature is to put a big reservoir of water there because that water has such a high heat capacity that um, it, it takes, it's a lot harder to change the temperature of the water. You, it takes either a longer time or a lot more um, energy to change the temperature of water than it does to change the temperature of air. So it makes it more stubborn. And so that's an example where if we're looking at how might we use smoothing delays, we might want to model the effect of heat capacity. We might want to model the effect of extra mass if we're talking about mass and, or velocity acceleration. We might want to model things like bucket diameter. So the larger a bucket, the more water I put into the bucket as, as a trickle coming in, the slower the height will change. So these are all sort of examples of stubbornness. And then actually in social systems. We may not know the physical mechanisms underlying why someone's more stubborn to social change than someone else, but we happen to know that maybe one group of people, one demographic, are less likely to be motivated to change their behaviors than others. And we can modify the time it takes for them to change or model the time it takes for them to change their behaviors using a smoothing delay with a very long delay. So that some of them might change their behaviors immediately, but for the majority of them, you know, 63.2% of them, it's gonna take this delay period to change. Whereas in another population, they might change almost immediately. So then that delay is gonna be a lot shorter. So we model kind of stubbornness with smoothing delays. So examples of things we can model with smoothing delays. All right, so, um, and then I bring in again, the toilet tank model and inertia and all that sort of stuff. So questions about fixed and smoothing delays. Delayed questions about fixed and smoothing delays. All right, so uh, it's been said that almost any dynamical system is can be modeled with like a set of linear equations, like really simple kind of equations without squares or whatever, and delays. And so knowing about delays, um, you know, like, a lot of like very sophisticated math to model things. If you just incorporate delay instead, actually makes the math a lot easier. So um, delays add so much richness to systems that that's the reason why we need to know about delays because so many systems are best modeled by simple math and delays as opposed to no delays and complex. All right, so then after that, that was pretty much, you know, after we got through lookup tables and delays, we didn't really learn anything new about system dynamics modeling. At that point, it was all just kind of examples and learning how to 
form these formulas, how to spot these common patterns and so on. So, um, and so like the SIR model was sort of our, our kind of first example of that. And, um, and so this is a very basic model that you probably have seen in some other classes um, where it uses three stocks to represent how um, many people are distributed um, across kind of sickness states in a population. I heard somebody unmute, is there a question? Sorry. Oh, no problem. Okay, so, um, so in this uh, SIR model, um, you know, our, our big question is how to form these formulas. And so the infected population will recover the back end of this, it really looks just like our bacterial death model. So um, we just have to think about what's the average amount of time it takes for someone who's sick to get well again. And that's the same thing as saying, what's the average lifetime of a bacteria? So if you know how many people are sick, it's just like knowing how many bacteria are alive. And you can then uh, divide that by the time it takes for them to get well. And that will give you the rate of conversion from sick people to recovered people or the rate of conversion from bacteria to dead bacteria. So, um, so that's basically all we did with this formula is we said that this flow recoveries is just the infected population and then basically divided by the duration of infection. So just put those two together. And so this pattern shows up a lot. Whenever you have these kind of structured population models where you ask how long are they in that box, then you usually just say, well, it's gonna be the number of people in that box divided by how long they're in that box. And in order to do make that formula, we need these links. So the links have to be there to make the formulas work. So, um, and that's it, that's that half of it. So that's a pattern definitely should know about. Um, now there, there are other um, formulas that, um, you know, that we've seen in this model, we keep track of the affected population and so on. The more complicated thing happened um, on the SI side. And that's where we had to think about, um, and I, I'm not gonna step through that in, in this case here, but that's one that might be worthwhile reviewing because if you think about um, you know, what goes into this infections flow, we had to keep in mind the current number of susceptibles, the current number of infected. Um, and um, so we had to know the contact rate of infected with anybody. And then if we know the current number of susceptibles and we divide them by the total number of people, then we can figure out how many of those contacts are actually with susceptibles. And from there, we can end up, if we know the infectivity, how many of those contacts actually transmit disease, we can figure out this flow. So this is a much more complex formula that we go over back in this lecture. If you feel comfortable forming this formula on your own, then um, you're gonna be in really good shape. Okay, so um, any questions about this diagram before I go in and you know, show our, our application of when we added this contact avoidance loop. All right, so hopefully like I'm, in your final projects, you probably think a lot of you have two or three stocks. So you're approaching this sort of level of complexity and some of the formulas you get um, may be kind of getting to sort of this level of complexity as well. Okay, all right, so um, in this example, uh, we also added this embellishment, a lookup table, where based on the number of people infected, then we modeled a quarantine policy going to effect that would reduce the total contacts per day. And they use this to talk about different scenarios, no quarantine, quarantine at 1000 people, so that's 10% of the population in this model, or quarantine at 2000 people, um, or 20% uh, uh, of the population in this model. And so when you looked at those things here, then they said that if you uh, never quarantine, you get an infectious peak that's pretty high, but it dies down pretty quickly. If you quarantine at 20% of the population uh, infections, then the infection peak, um, it cuts off, but it goes on a little longer. If you quarantine at only 10% of the population, uh, that's the most aggressive quarantine policy, then the infection peak doesn't get very high, but it lasts very long. And this was significant because if you um, look at the number who are actually get the disease across these three quarantine policies, there's not much of a difference. But um, if you look back at these infection peaks, if you 
consider there's like a hospital capacity that's like say here, then infection peak two and one are above the, this maximum hospital capacity, whereas three stays below it the whole time. And so what these dynamics show us is that whereas a mathematical model often focuses only on the steady state, what happens at time infinity. And it, you know, if we think about like after the epidemic, almost everybody has the disease regardless of what the quarantine policy was. But if we, what the simulation lets us do is look about the transients during the epidemic. And during the epidemic, it allows us to see that the infection peak can actually overwhelm a hospital system. Or if um, it's kept low enough, it can be uh, handled by the hospital system without any problems. And so this kind of simulation shows us that the value of quarantining isn't reducing the spread of disease, it's managing the spread of disease so that um, those who get the disease can get the care they need to survive it. So that's something that we kind of learned through this SIR model. It's not about minimizing the extent, it's about minimizing the kind of cost during the transit. All right, so any questions about the SIR model? Questions online? Questions about anything else that's come up? I don't want this to just be a boring review. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, no problem. Uh, stage one of the exam, you get one sheet, double sided, um, hand produced, well, self produced. So I don't just, I don't want you to photocopy anything. If you want to type it or whatever you'd like uh, digitally, that's fine. But I don't want you to like, take um, you know, copies out of Warcraft or anything like that. So I want you to force yourself to either hand write it or hand type it or hand draw it. Uh, but, um, but yeah, you get one, the same as the midterm, one double-sided. Any other questions that have come up? All right, so we talked a lot about S-shaped growth. Um, we, uh, you know, it's generically, we've seen it all throughout. Um, you know, the fish models where we kind of started talking about this. We talked about how you can reformulate the, um, the fish model in this funny little way where we imagine these potential fish being kind of a stock that, and, uh, and the actual fish being another stock. And the birth process is like a conversion process of turning a potential fish into an actual fish. And this seems a little silly, but by creating these potential stocks, so they, they don't actually exist, but we can keep track of them, then it allows us to better see the, these S-shaped growth uh, patterns here, where you've got a reinforcing loop where the more fish you get, later, the more fish you get because fish produce more fish. This is like the exponential growth pressure. But then you also see the logistic side of it where as you get more and more fish, there's less fish left to be born. And so that's where you see this balancing side come into play. So even though these don't exist in reality, by definition, they're you know, potential fish, um, this is a way of sort of modeling the remaining capacity in the limited resource so that we better capture these two things. And that was done in this BAS model. Um, so this kind of relates to this SIR model and it's kind of, you know, I've just borrowed some of these slides here, but in the BAS model of innovation diffusion, that's basically what they did here as well. And it might make even more sense here than it does in a fish model, but it's the same thing. Um, so Frank Bass, when he built this model, this dynamical systems model, which he actually built in, mathematical form, but then it was translated into the stock and flow model. So now it's actually more common to represent it as stocks and flows, is that he said, we have adopters of a technology and we have potential adopters. And I think it resonates more with the BAS model because these potential adopters are real people that are out there. They just haven't bought the product yet. Whereas the remaining fish capacity are like imaginary fish that could exist, but don't exist yet. So somehow it seems more artificial there, but it's the exact same thing. So there is a carrying capacity for a product. Netflix, you hear right now, is going through a bunch of trouble because people are realizing that they've saturated their market. Nobody else is, um, is getting, you know, new Netflix subscriptions are not continuing to rise and they're facing competition from others. And that's why now they're trying to get people, you know, they're cracking down on password sharing and all that because they're trying to squeeze as many new adopters they can out of the market as possible because they are up 
against saturation. The same way a fish population up against carrying capacity, it's really hard to find food once you're over carrying capacity. Like it's a, you never wanna be close to carrying capacity. You never wanna be close to market saturation. So that's what this is modeling here is that there's a certain number of people who could possibly subscribe to Netflix and there's people who actually subscribe to Netflix. And when this number goes to zero, you're gonna be in a world of hurt if your um, you know, shareholders expect you to survive on growth. So that's kind of what the BAS model was talking about here. And the way they modeled the BAS model was pretty much the same way they modeled inspection spread in the SIR model. So whereas in the fish model, you got new fish through this um, exponential growth process. Here, um, it's much more of a contagion idea where adopters bump into potential adopters. And based on the number of adopters and potential adopters, you get a churn from potential adopters over to adopters. And this really is just the SIR model. You've got a total contacts per day, you've got an infectivity, and then your total population. And that, um, so that was kind of, so you can think of the BAS model as like a merger of the fish population logistic growth model and the SIR model together. The big difference between the BAS model and the SIR model is in the SAR model, we have no idea where the disease came from initially. We just initially assume that some individuals, one or two of them are infected and we watch how it spreads. In the BAS model, we, um, we actually need to get those one or two people to have the product in the first place. And so he added um, advertising as well. So there's this adoption of advertising where even if there are no adopters, there is an assumption that if you dump money into advertising, eventually you'll get one of these potential adopters to spontaneously become an adopter, even though it hasn't observed an adopter. And once you get some adopters in here, word of mouth takes over and the contagion process really grows the market up to saturation. That's the idea behind this BAS model. So any questions about the BAS model and how it works? Yeah, oh, so or anything else. Yeah. A uh, great question. So in the, the idea, this remaining fish capacity here, this is like, so carrying capacity is a parameter. It's a constant and it never changes throughout the sim. Remaining fish capacity is like carrying capacity minus fish stock. So the fish stock is gonna rise up to carrying capacity and the gap between carrying capacity and fish stock is the remaining fish capacity. So if you were to add up at any time, these two stocks, remaining fish capacity and fish stock, you would get the carrying capacity. Does that make sense? Okay. So BAS model, advertising, any other questions? But S-shaped growth, the BAS model, its relationship to the SIR model. So when you're seeing these patterns, it's just reusing the same sort of patterns over and over um, in slightly different syntheses so to create these new models that model these different phenomena. And we talked about you can bolt on things to the BAS model for different types of purchases. Um, you can have, you know, we talked about um, the, the durable goods and discard and all those sorts of things. And so those are sort of some things we talked about a little bit back then too, which are just again, modifications of the basic BAS model. All right, so that's all of unit E. Any questions over that? It's like, you know, epidemic dynamics and S-shaped growth. All right, so then after, um, any questions online? All right, so after unit E, um, we went into, you know, unit F, our sort of last book unit, and we just went through a number of different chapters which gave case studies of dynamical systems models uh, for, for different phenomena, public policies, et cetera. And so, um, I just talked with you know modeling an oil industry, how um, you can model things at different granularity. So that was kind of the big thing I wanted you to take out of this is that um, you might model OPEC at fine granularity. So fine grain, we've got uh, Saudi Arabia and the handful of others who are in OPEC, but then everybody else, even though there, there could be thousands of players, but they all are sort of, you know, no individual there 
has a disproportionate share of influence on the market. So we just bundle them together, just the way we bundle like everybody who's susceptible, everybody who's infectious, everybody who's recovered, just kind of together. So we had kind of a coarse grained model of the individual investors and a fine grained model of OPEC, and we blended them together in this oil model. And so the, for the coarse grained model of the market, we just used you know, a, a balancing loop with delay to set the price. And so um, we know that balancing loops with delays can generate oscillations. We know that there are oscillations in markets. So we said that the independents, just generic independents out there, they produce oil and the oil that they produce goes into quantity supplied and the quantity demanded, the interaction between supplied and demanded gives you a price. That price comes back to the independents if that price is higher than they're expecting or lower than they're expecting is they'll adjust their production and you get a little balancing feedback loop. The other half of that was the fine grain model where we added on these special players who do have a disproportionate share or uh, control over the market. And we talked about the swing producers and so on. So we talked about, you know, you've got Saudi Arabia, you got everybody else, and they basically can dump as much oil as they want onto the market can pull as much oil as they want off the market so that they have sole control over the price. And that's what was simulated here. When you combine those two things together, you get all sorts of interesting complex dynamics, which match a lot of the dynamics we see in you know, the real system of uh, looking at oil prices over hundreds of years. So that's just a reminder that we did talk about that. Um, I'm not gonna ask you about specific equations, you know, how is swing producer represented mathematically, but, um, but I do think it's a good case study to kind of remember this idea that you can wrap up kind of uh, coarse grained models of small players coupled with fine grained models of big players to create these interesting dynamics. So that's kind of the important thing to remember. So any questions about this example, how it worked? Okay, questions online, questions about anything? Again, they'll want this just to be a boring review. If there's better things for me to talk about, I'm happy to talk about them or answer questions about. Okay. Talking about public sector applications. So um, this was, you know, the, the how do we model a city? Um, and uh, sort of this was an example of forming a dynamic hypothesis of what you think drives a city, um, choosing stocks and flows to build in your model, putting them together with a coordinating network, consistent with your hypothesis so that you can run your simulation and generate uh, predicted outcomes if your dynamic hypothesis are true. And if those predicted outcomes don't look like the real life, then maybe your hypothesis was wrong. If those do match real life, then maybe you've got a surrogate that you can play with to learn about real life. And that's what we did here with this model of kind of a city growth here. Um, because it was a model of growth, then the idea here is we had to have a, a major growth engine. It was limited by land. It was limited by the aging of infrastructure, which also coupled into the land limit. And then it was also limited by city attractiveness. And so um, the, you know, so you had to model the workforce as well as the infrastructure. And the thought was if you captured these dynamics, workforce and infrastructure, then maybe you could um, explain with realistic scaling, the um, S-shaped growth patterns that you saw in real cities. And that's effectively what uh, they did. So generated this dynamic hypothesis into stocks, build a system, chose parameters, test it. Um, so the stock and flow model looked a little bit like this thing. I'm not gonna go through all these details, uh, but um, again, if you, if you were to step through this, it really doesn't, it's just embellishments of things like the SIR model. It's just these age structured models where industry looks almost exactly like an SIR model. Housing is like an SIR model with a couple of uh, coming into the I and a couple coming directly into R. And then the population is like an SIR model where you've got these bi-directional flows as well. So it's just an embellishment of all the patterns that we've seen before turned into more complex models. And with that, they were able to generate um, simulated London trajectories that looked like real London trajectories. And it allowed them to ask questions about, you know, what, what are the sort of leading indicators for a city's decline? You know, and it looks like there's like, 
you know, labor rises and starts falling before um, all the rest, like worker housing, um, it looks like it maybe starts falling a little ahead of labor. So it really looks like maybe worker housing is the key limitation here. And if you really want to try to keep the growth going, it's important not necessarily to have a bunch of industry, but to have a bunch of nice places for workers to live. That might be what we take from this diagram here. So by, um, by finding um, a simulation model that produces very similar trajectories that you see, that allows us to look like, like a microscope deeper on the real system. So we use the model as a lens to look down deeper in the real system. All right, so any questions about this example? Okay. Uh, we talked about that um, with um, the fish fishery example. This is where we got into tipping points and so on. So, um, you know, a tipping point. We, you know, I gave this example of a refrigerator. Um, refrigerators. It's a rectangle. It should be in one of the two stable configurations for a rectangle. So, a rectangle can be sitting on its short end or it can be sitting on its long end. If it's well, operating correctly, it's sitting on its short end. If you tilt it a little bit, you can still nudge it and it'll stay sitting on its short end. But if you eventually tilt it to a point where the center of mass is over the foot of the, of the uh, refrigerator, if you tip it just a little bit, it's gonna go from sitting on its short end to sitting on its long end. And it's still technically stable in this configuration. It's, it's not gonna move in this configuration. Um, but um, if you were to restore its angle back to the original one, it's gonna stay in the wrong configuration. The only way to get it working again is to tilt it way the other direction until it finally sits back upright in the right configuration. So we refer to this as a tipping point um, because it is a point at which it's a parameter, it's a, it's a like the angle of this. It's a parameter that if you go beyond that parameter, that tipping point, your system's dynamics fundamentally change where you, your system might have two states. It might have a stable state and like an extinction state. And if, um, and we want it to be in the sort of like sustainable state, uh, but if we push it too far, it might get into the sort of unsustainable state. And the only way to go back to the sustainable state is by taking drastic action. And it might actually be impossible to go back. So we gave this example from the fishery and it all came out of this net regeneration rate curve. And the idea here was that you can have a fish stock which sits at carrying capacity, you introduce some boats. And as you introduce boats, they start catching fish causing the number of fish in, the, in the, um, the fishery to go down, which causes their regeneration rate to go up, which causes them to balance out. So you reach a sustainable outcome. So that's something you should know. How do we, what, what represents sustainability in these dynamical systems models? Well, generally the things that represent sustainability are a variable staying constant like the fish stock or inflows and outflows balancing. So if there are two forces, one that's causing a system to want to change in one direction, another causing a system to want to change in another direction, they come to balance, that is a sign of sustainability, balance. And so this system has the benefit that as you increase the number of, of ships, as the number of fish decrease, their regeneration rate increases, which causes the fish to always bring the system back into balance. So we're taking more fish out, and the remaining few fish in the fishery are giving us more fish back per year. And that brings things into balance. That's a sustainable outcome. But that only can go on so far. And so there is this tipping point, this number of ships, that if we go on a little bit too far, then we can get collapse. And that's what this graph is showing. So, um, so this point here is gonna be that tipping point. As, you, as the density gets lower and lower, the regeneration rate gets higher and higher, but that stops when you hit this point here. And that's gonna stop at a critical fish density that we'll see in a second we call maximum sustainable yield, which sure you've heard that term in some other courses. Um, so that density, that critical density right there, if you push the fish density below that, 
you go from spending your interest to spending your principal. So, um, so at that point there, that max regeneration rate, that density right there, again, that's the maximum sustainable yield. That's the tipping point of the system. If you go a little bit farther, then now, um, as the fish density gets lower, the regeneration rate gets lower. So you don't have a balancing effect anymore. So if you're on this side of the graph, as you fish more, you get more fish out and things come into balance. On this side of the graph, it's the opposite. It's like the dynamics are totally different on this side of the graph. This is the refrigerator sitting upright on its short edge. This is the ref refrigerator sitting on its long edge. And so, um, so that's this sort of tipping right here. So I'm getting just stepping through. These are all old slides we had. And we call this tipping point in the fish system or in population systems a maximum sustainable yield. It's generally roughly half the carrying capacity. You, um, if you've got a renewable resource, you always want to keep above the maximum sustainable yield. Um, and that uh, helps ensure, again, that you're spending out of interest, not out of principle in your kind of bank account in that analogy here. And so what happens in this example is they go over that point. So they raise the number of ships and um, up, and they raise the catch up. And because they raise um, the, because the catch, so if we look here, this lines two and three, two is the regeneration rate of the fish, three is the catch coming out of the fishery. Because they raise the catch so high, that's above the maximum regeneration rate. So it tries to recover, but it just can't. Never comes into balance, and then you rapidly go into extinction. And because we're on the wrong side of the net regeneration curve, even when you lower the number of ships back to a level that was once sustainable, and the catch back to a level that was once sustainable, the system continues to extinction because it's not in that special part. It's on the wrong side of the regeneration curve. It's like a totally different dynamical system. It's the refrigerator sitting on its long edge instead of its short edge. And, um, and so the only thing you really can do is totally back off and stop fishing at all and wait for the natural processes to set this thing upright again, if that's even possible to do. So that's the reason kind of we talk about these sort of tipping points examples here. So. Again, just borrowing slides from that. The system reached a tipping point. And this is all the stuff we've said before. Tipping points are particularly um, uh, bad when they're irreversible. So um, the refrigerator example, although you should never tip refrigerator on its side because it kind of screws up the coolant and then you have to set it like upright. You have to let it sit there for like 48 hours, but it'll be okay. It happens. Um, if you tip a wine glass over, um, you spill out all the wine, you're never getting that wine back in the wine glass. So a bunch of tipping points are totally irreversible. There's no way to just set them over, you know, with a drastic change and fix everything. And so the worry is that there's a bunch of these tipping points all over the planet. You know, if you melt all the ice in the ice caps, um, you might be able to freeze the earth again, but you may not get those ice caps back, you know? So, so that's, they're a resource that once that principle has gone, there's no way to easily bring it back. So that's an example of these reverse, these irreversible tipping points. So we have a, the bad tipping points, like in terms of climate change. There's interesting tipping points that aren't necessarily good or bad, like political instability. So when we're talking about social scientists, when they're thinking about what goes on in, um, in different nation states, then they're interested in tipping points too. So how much abuse will a population, will a group of people take before they decide to rebel. And, um, and if they've reached the tipping point, even if you start showering them with gifts afterwards, if you've pushed them beyond that point, you're not gonna stop the rebellion. And, um, and then they will overthrow the government, even if the government magically goes back and gives them everything that they said they wanted. So that's an example of a tipping point in social systems. There can be good tipping points as well, um, you can advertise uh, particular behaviors that are maybe, you know, have positive outcomes like recycling or something like that. And you don't have to advertise forever because once you change people's opinions, then you can back off your advertising dollars and people will now, even though you're not telling them they should recycle, they've now have um, believe in recycling. And so they've crossed the tipping point where now they're at a new equilibrium 
where um, they'll recycle on their own without anybody telling you to do so. So there are bad tipping points, there are interesting tipping points, and there are good tipping points. So the dynamical systems theory behind it is all the same, but you know how what we're actually studying kind of varies by context. All right, and there are other examples here too. So um, any questions about tipping points? I kind of had a question. Uh, yeah, there's a question online. About maximum sustainable yield. I remember you saying something about how it's usually measured in terms of the y-axis, but it's actually a measure of the x-axis, I believe. Yeah, like so there's that. a question. The question online is about maximum sustainable yield, and it can be a little confusing in that it sounds like something that would be measured. I'll go to this graph maybe here. It sounds like something that should be measured. It says because it sounds like yield, like it should be something that's measured in terms of what's on the y axis, like the actual maximum regeneration rate. Um, but although maximum sustainable yield is associated with the population level that provides the maximum regeneration rate, formally speaking, the term MSY, maximum sustainable yield, corresponds to the actual population level. So I meant to go to. So I lost my mouse. So the maximum sustainable yield is actually this density. So the formal definition of MSY is roughly half the carrying capacity. It's actually a population level. So the maximum sustainable yield, it sounds like it should be a regeneration rate, like the maximum sustainable yield should be whatever this ends up being, 600 or 550 or something like that. But in reality, the maximum sustainable yield here is a fish density of 60%. So, um, so it's, um, again, it's roughly half the carrying capacity. Um, it sort of represents, it's really kind of uh, important. It sort of captures this distance here. It's how much of the resource you can deplete before you start crossing into this borrowing from principal instead of interest. So it's really like how much interest is in uh, the bank account. So, so MSY. Just think roughly half the carrying capacity. It's a, it's a population measure, not a regeneration measure, even though it kind of sounds like a regeneration measure. Okay, I hope that answered the question. Any other questions about tipping points? Yeah. For the graph that talks about the ships, that graph is never actually operating at maximum sustainable yield. Well, so at this point right here, that's the point where it actually hits. Um, so if I were to look at the, the fish stock, so this at this point here, that's roughly say 60% or so of the carrying capacity that corresponds to this density. So if we were to plot density here instead of fish stock, so this divided by the carrying capacity, then that peak right there would correspond to that peak there and that population density there. All right, any other questions? Everybody feel comfortable reading these funny graphs from Moorcroft, these stellar graphs with like, you know, they've got the legend up here where it says one, two, three, four, and they're the one, two, threes are kind of inside the lines. And the, um, then over here, it shows you that like one corresponds to an axis with 2000 on that line, two and three correspond to 500 on that line, and four correspond to 40 in that line. Hopefully that makes sense. I might use some of these graphs, so it's good to be able to read these graphs. Okay. Okay. All right, what else we got? So tipping points, irreversibility. Uh, I also talked a little bit about um, uh, bifurcation diagrams. So um, I didn't talk a lot about this, so um, uh, wouldn't expect a lot of questions about bifurcation diagrams. Um, but the idea here is we'd like to summarize for all possible harvest rates, what are the kind of outcomes, sustainable and unsustainable. And so the idea here was that this um, net regeneration curve here tells me that for any given harvest rate, that's what's on the x-axis here, if I, I can find the balancing net regeneration rate, 
And for a curve like this, that's hump shaped, there will be two net regeneration rates that bring the system perfectly into balance. So if the fish density was either this density or this density exactly, and the harvest rate was held exactly at this level, then the system would sit there stable. It would sit, the pop, fish population would not change. Things would be in balance. But this one is on the bad side of the curve and this one's on the good side of the curve. So because of that, then in this uh, point here, if you added one fish so that now there's more regeneration than harvest, the population would grow and grow and grow and eventually would hit that other point. Or if you took away one fish, so maybe somebody got greedy and they harvested a little more than that harvest rate, then um, the regeneration rate would be less than the harvest rate and the population would sink and sink and sink and go to extinction. So even though technically this fish density brings the population into balance for this harvest rate, we refer to it as being unstable because one small perturbation causes it to either um, you know, population to suddenly grow because it's much bigger than the harvest rate or fall to extinction because the regeneration rate can't keep up. Whereas this one is stable. So if you were to add one fish, it would make the regeneration rate go down, um, which would then cause that fish to get eaten up until it comes back to that population level. If you were to take a fish away, it would cause the regeneration rate to go up, which would cause the fish to grow until they reached a uh, balance again. So this is sort of um, brings things back into balance. So that's uh, stable. And then extinction is always stable. If there's no fish, if you're to add one fish, you wouldn't be able to keep up with this harvest rate. So you'll go back to extinction and you can't take any fish away. So we've got a stable extinction point. We've got a stable sustainable point here and we've got this unstable point in between. And we can, for every harvest rate, we can keep track of where all these points are and we can put them, we can kind of take this graph and kind of like imagine um, stretching it out onto this diagram we call a bifurcation diagram where you've got every harvest rate and then we can kind of draw these lines up and figure out where the extinction point is, uh, where the unstable point is, where the other stable point is. And we can see that after a particular point, all you've got is extinction. And that's what ends up forming this fold bifurcation here where you've got below a certain harvest rate, you've got extinction and, um, and sustainable outcomes. And as long as you start above this unstable point, you'll always rush towards the sustainable outcome. But if you harvest things too much, you lose the sustainable outcome, you'll race down towards the extinction point. And the only way to get back into sustainability is by choking off the harvest so that it brings you back into this area up here. So we can summarize that with kind of colors is to sort of say that we've got a sustainable region where for any harvest rate, your fish population better be in the blue and an unsustainable region. So if for any fish population, you have a, a, a small list of harvest rates that are sustainable or for any harvest rate, you have a list of fish populations that are sustainable. And if the harvest rate is sufficiently high, then there's no uh, sustainable option. So, you know, so that's kind of this dark line here is the sort of sustainable outcome. And when you have something like this, where you've got two black lines, kind of sustainable and unsustainable, where the sustainable one goes away, then um, that's the, that's that point where this goes away, that's the tipping point. So a tipping point is where the dynamics suddenly change you go from having a good outcome to having no good outcomes, unless you can somehow get the system back into this, uh, this version here. So, and that's the tipping point. And I gave this example where you can start sustainable, think you're good. So what you end up doing is increase your harvest rate. But once you're in this unsustainable region, then the fish are going to start um, decreasing and they're gonna go more and more towards extinction. So the only thing you can do is reduce your harvest rate. But even though this was a sustainable harvest rate, now it's beneath this line. So you're gonna still keep going to extinction. So your only choice then is to make your harvest rate much, much less, basically take all the boats away. Once you're finally in this blue region, then you can let natural processes bring you back up to the sustainable outcome. And only after waiting for that to happen, you can re-increase your harvest rate and then things will come back to the original point here.
So this idea here where you get a small change that, um, that knocks your system out of the kind of sustainability that requires a giant change to bring it back is something we call hysteresis. It's a history dependence. And, um, and a lot of these small change, large change, and this is hysteresis, and a lot of these tipping points correspond to these hysteresis effects. And that's one of the reasons it's so scary to be up near tipping points because a small change that, you know, it seems like you should be able to fix it um, actually may not be able to be fixed or if it can be fixed, it might take, you know, many, many years for that fix to, to actually be realized um, or a lot of energy, a lot of extra effort. So a little bit of effort to go in the wrong direction, a lot of effort to come back to the right direction. All right, so any questions about tipping points, bifurcation diagrams or anything else? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you can think of this, uh, this funny shape, this U shape here, that I never can do this from this side of the screen. Um, this U shape here, that is the net regeneration curve that's just been flipped. So instead of fish density, it's fish population. So this is like zero density here, and that's like carrying capacity up there. And this is like their regeneration rate. The regeneration rate is now plotted on the X axis as the harvest rate. Yeah. Is it likely we're going to see this diagram where it's flipped on its side? Uh, well, I said, I'm not going to, I didn't, we didn't talk a lot of bifurcation diagrams, so I wouldn't expect more than like one question about bifurcation diagrams. Um, and I might, you know, ask you about bifurcation diagrams. Where's the tipping point? Well, you know, what does a hysteresis mean? You know, those sorts of things. This is this particularly hard to do. Yeah, well, this is like the standard, this particular bifurcation diagram with this fold is like the textbook bifurcation diagram. So this is the good one to learn with this little like divide here or whatever. All right, so we are at time. If anybody's got any individual questions, please feel free to come up afterwards. Got anything else? Send me a note instead of office hours or whatever. Um, and stage one is on Thursday. So I'll be here. You don't have to be, you can take it at home. You got Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, but if you want to take it here, feel free to show up here and I'll be here for the 90 minutes, unless nobody shows up and then I'll leave. Uh, let me uh, go ahead and, are there any uh, extra questions online? If not, I've got a question in class and I'm gonna go ahead and close the room or at least stop the recording. Bye.